Hi everyone, in this video we're going to derive an expression for the nth term of the Fibonacci sequence, and our starting point is going to be the recurrence relation that I've written up at the top of the screen here. Now what this recurrence relation says is that to get to the nth term of the sequence, in other words un, you take the previous term, which is un minus 1, and you add on the term before that, which is un minus 2. Right, so essentially this is just a formal mathematical way of expressing the idea that any term in this sequence is the sum of the previous two terms. So if we want to know what the nth term is, essentially what we need to do is just solve this recurrence relation, which is exactly what we're going to do. So the first step uh, that, that I'm going to do is to rearrange this so that all the terms are on the same side. So I'm just going to say un minus un minus 1 minus un minus 2 has to be equal to 0. Now, if, like me, you have a background in physics, then the method for solving something like this is going to look kind of familiar because it's very similar to the method that we tend to use to solve um, second order ordinary differential equations, which is basically to guess a trial solution, substitute it in, and see what happens. So the trial solution that I'm going to guess here um, is as follows. We're going to try a geometric, um, geometric sequence-like term. In other words, the nth term, un is going to be proportional to some number r to the power of n. Now, we don't know the value of r yet. That's something that we're going to have to find out. So the idea behind this is that what we're doing is taking a linear combination of three terms, right, un minus un minus 1 minus un minus 2, and requiring that linear combination to be 0. And in uh, this geometric sequence, right, where the nth term is r to the power of n, each term is just r times the previous term. And so the idea is that we want to choose r in exactly the right way to make these terms combine together to give 0. To find the value of r that works, we just want to take the solution and substitute it into our recurrence relation. right? So uh, un is just r to the power of n. un minus 1 is just r to the power of n minus 1. And u n minus 2 is r to the power of n minus 2. So this equation is actually um, nicer than it looks because you can factor out um, an r to the power of n minus 2. And let's see what happens if we do that. So if we factorize out that term, well, the first term then has to be r squared, right? Because if you times r to the n minus 2 by r squared, you get r to the n, which was our first term. Then our second term is going to have to be a minus r, Right? because this is essentially like r to the power of 1, and so if we times it by that prefactor, we get r to the power of n minus 1. And then you just have to subtract 1 um, as your final term, because, well, you've already got r to the n minus 2 there. So this has to be 0. Now, <clears throat> assuming that r itself is not 0, which is a valid solution, by the way, it's just not a very interesting solution. Assuming that r itself is not 0, then we require um, the stuff in the brackets to be 0. Right, so I'm just going to say, well, if r is not 0, that requires r squared minus r minus 1 to be 0, which is just a quadratic equation which we can solve um, in whatever way we like. I'm going to do completing the square. So very quickly, um, we would get r minus a half, all squared. Um, then uh, if we expand those brackets, we would get plus a quarter, but we want to have minus 1. Right, so to go from plus a quarter to minus one, you have to subtract off five quarters. And so um, I'm just going to do minus five quarters there. Okay, so that has to be zero. And then we've just got to rearrange this basically to make r the subject. So if we take the five quarters over to the other side and then take the square root and then put the half on the other side, um, we get, uh, well, r is going to be one half. And then when we take the square root, we've got to remember that um, you can get a positive answer or a negative answer, so it's going to be plus or minus uh, the square root of 5 quarters. And we've got two distinct solutions for r. I'm going to denote those as r plus and r minus just to kind of distinguish them, right? So we've got these two solutions, and if we simplify that just a little bit more, um, we find that our two solutions, r plus and r minus, are 1 plus or minus root 5 over 2, all right? Um, so one thing to notice about this, by the way, is that the positive solution is 1 plus root 5 over 2, which is the golden ratio, which is something that a lot of people get quite excited about. Anyway, 
Um, what that means is, because we've got two different solutions, our general solution is going to be a linear combination of uh, of both of those solutions, right? And so um, to write that in a mathematical way, that just means that our nth term in general is going to be some constant a, which we don't know yet, times the positive um, solution to the power of n, plus some other constant b, which we don't know yet, uh, times the other solution r minus uh, to the power of n. So again, this uh, has something in common with second order ordinary differential equations in that um, our general solution has some unknown constants in it. And now to determine what a and b are, we have to basically supply some initial conditions. In other words, we have to specify a couple of specific terms in the sequence. Now it's conventional um, to let the first two terms just be equal to one, right? And so um, I'm gonna say, let u1 and u2 um, both be equal to one because that will allow us, that gives us some new constraints, which will allow us to determine the values of a and b, right? So if we use the fact that u1 is equal to one, what I can do is say that, well, one is equal to a times r plus to the power of one, but r plus to the power of one is just r plus. Um, and then you get b uh, times r minus the power of one. Again, I don't have to write that power of one in. Right, so this comes from our first initial condition that u1 has to equal one. Um, and then we also get one is equal to a r plus squared plus b r minus squared, which again just comes from that general un equation and just substituting in uh, n equals two because we know that the second term uh, is, is something that we're requiring to be equal to one. So this is just a pair of simultaneous equations for a and b which we can just solve because we know r plus and r minus. The way I'm going to do that is actually rewrite the second equation using the uh, the quadratic equation we had earlier for, for r, right? So we know that r squared minus r minus 1 is equal to 0. If r squared minus r minus 1 is 0 for both of the r values, that's the same as saying r squared is equal to r plus 1. And so um, just to make the algebra a little bit nicer, um, I'm going to just rewrite that second equation in the form 1 is equal to a times r plus plus 1 um, plus b times r minus plus 1, right? Because r plus squared is the same as r plus plus 1 and r minus squared is the same as r minus plus 1 just from that quadratic that we had earlier, right? So if I label my equations uh, 1, and 2, what I could do is subtract them. If I do 2 um, minus 1, second equation minus the first equation, that's going to make the a r plus and the b um, r minus cancel out, right? So if we do the subtraction, we get 0 on the left-hand side. Um, the r plus and r minus terms actually all cancel out, and we're just left with these um, uh, a times 1 and b times 1 terms from the uh, second equation. So we just get 0 equals a plus b, um, or a equals minus b, right? Now, given that a equals minus b, we can take that fact and substitute it back into the first equation and get 1 is equal to, um, well, we're going to get r plus times a still. But if I write b as minus a, I can just factor out an a and say 1 is equal to r plus minus r minus times a, right? Just using the fact that b is equal to minus a. So this pretty much immediately gives us our value of a, because if you think about what happens if you subtract r plus and r minus, going back to our, uh, our solutions for r plus and r minus up there, if you subtract them, the, the one on the numerator will cancel, right? Because you're doing one minus one on the numerator, um, then you get root 5 minus minus root 5, which is 2 root 5, but then the whole thing is divided by 2. And so r plus minus r minus is just equal to minus, uh, sorry, it's just equal to root 5. And so our solution for a um, is just going to be 1 over root 5. And we already said earlier that b was just minus a, and so b is going to be minus 1 over root 5. And we're actually now done because we've determined our constants in the case where the first two terms are 1, right? So um, I'm just going to write out our, our final expression. So un 
it's going to be, well, remember the first term was our a term. So we get a 1 over root 5. Then we get r plus to the power of n. r plus was uh, the golden ratio 1 plus root 5 over 2. That's all to the power of n. Then we've got our second term, the b term, which is going to be minus 1 over root 5. Um, and then we get the r minus term to the power of n from, from uh, that equation earlier. And so, yeah, I'll just put 1 minus root 5 over 2 uh, to the power of n. And there we go. That's the nth term of the Fibonacci sequence, right? So I guess it's kind of interesting that when you plug in any integer value of n, the third parts kind of all cancel out and you are indeed left with an integer result.